much for joining us for the next session of Einride Mesh. Uh, I'm Seth Clevenger, Managing Editor at Transport Topics and TTNews.com, industry trade press covering the freight transportation industry with a special focus on technology. So this is a great event for me to attend personally. And uh, you know, on a personal note, I've been watching Enride uh, over the years. Uh, in fact, the first time I met Robert, the CEO, was 2018 in Washington, D.C. at uh, the Transportation Research Board. So it's amazing to see how the industry's conversation has evolved uh, these past five years. Uh, but without any further delay, I'd like to go ahead and uh, make some introductions uh, for our panel here. Uh, first off, I'm very excited to bring in uh, Steve Vaselli. He, uh, Steve is an economic sociologist, is an author, a researcher, and an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's, his current research examines development and uh, potential impacts of self-driving trucks. So he's a expert, you know, certainly an expert on this field and a great person to have on the panel. So thank you for joining us, Steve. Great to have you on board. Uh, also joining us is Tiffany Heathcott. Uh, she's Einride's uh, first remote operator. I see. And uh, in addition, you know, Tiffany is an experienced truck driver with a CDL, so she's uh, been a part of this industry for, for many years. Uh, she has an autonomous driving certification, which is also a pretty unique uh, qualification these days, uh, at least for now. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, her experiences are perfect for this conversation. So thank you for joining us on stage, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. Well, we'll go ahead and get comfortable here and take a seat. And uh, to start this conversation, you know, I mentioned briefly, you know, um, my role covering the transportation industry. I've been at Transport Topics for 12 years, and I remember when I started, really none of what you see here was even part of the conversation. Really, when you think about the issues that never go away, you know, that I've heard this in my entire career uh, in this field has been workforce related. And maybe we'll just start with that. And you know, Steve, I know that you know, much of your work and research is you know in this uh, uh, on this particular topic. So, you know, from your vantage point, why do you think driver turnover rates are so high? Uh, why do trucking companies consistently struggle to recruit and retain professional drivers? And um, you know, just kind of curious, you know, what, from a you know, top level view, what are the issues at play here? Yeah, thanks, Seth. It's great to be here. So, as you said, this is not; these are not new issues. These are these are chronic issues that have uh, been a problem in some segments, like truckload, since the last big transformation, which was deregulation. And so, at that time, we developed a system out of the regulated trucking, which was less than truckload with terminals and 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 good jobs where most drivers were home at night, into one where drivers live out of the truck that they operate. And at the root of that is cheap labor, cheaper labor, um, and an inefficient use of it. And I think that echoes the themes we're going to be hearing all day. Um, when we have drivers who wait unpaid at docks and then live out of the machine that they're operating, you know, we talked about asset utilization in the last panel. Um, you know, a lot of these trucks are only moving six and a half, seven hours a day. And what that means is that you have drivers who are having to live on the road. And it's tough and, and it, to, to live on the road, whether it's the, um, the health issues, uh, the family issues, the, the personal issues that come from it. And uh, Tiffany, and I, Tiffany and I were talking earlier, it's getting tougher because we've got more congestion, we've got worse behavior from four-wheelers out there. Um, and so the job is becoming more dangerous for drivers. And so these are jobs that inherently have some challenges to them that make it tough to keep people in them. You know, Tiffany, as a truck driver yourself and many years on the road, uh, what's your perspective on this? Uh, you know, why do you think drivers leave their jobs so often and, and why does the industry struggle uh, so much to, to find folks who want to be in this job long term? I think the first thing is the um, unrealistic expectations about the job. Uh, people don't know what they're getting into. Uh, being on the road for 14 weeks at a time is not very appealing to most people. And when they do it one time, they're done. And uh, I think the biggest reason why they're not able to hire new is the low pay and conditions, work conditions. Yeah. And of course, that, uh, you know, I think brings us uh, very nicely into a good segue here on, on autonomous trucking and, and how that might fit into this labor market and, and this workforce. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, observers, I say, in, in years past, and it still exists to some extent, but especially those outside of our industry sometimes see you know, autonomous trucks, what does this mean for drivers? Is it going to put drivers out of work? You know, that narrative still exists. 
I think those of us who work in the industry understand that the realities of the labor market, uh, you know, it's just not very uh, realistic that uh, somebody who wants to be a professional truck driver and is qualified and is a safe driver uh, will be put out of work. I mean, I know every fleet I know is just going to line up to, to hire you in a, in a heartbeat, you know, if you're qualified uh, and, and want to do the job. Uh, so really, when you talk to fleet managers and as well as developers, you know, like an Enride, uh, you know, the concept is really more about complementing the workforce and maybe shifting jobs toward you know, positions that are more desirable. It's not about replacing truck drivers. We're going to need truck drivers for, for decades to come and you know, really the, the foreseeable future. Uh, so you know, that's the, the you know, kind of the world we live in here. But uh, I want to bring my panel in uh, to, to weigh in on how the jobs of the future might change you know, and how automation uh, can shift some of those jobs that to, to positions that might be a little bit more uh, attractive to the next generation. You know, Steve, I'll get your you know, sort of overall thoughts on, on that. Yeah, so I think we are looking at transformative technology here. I think the a truck that can drive itself and uh, can perform twice the number of miles in a day that, that a human-driven truck uh, can is, is going to be a fundamental um, game changer for trucking. Right now, our logistic system, the way we move freight, is inherently based on the, the capabilities of a human-driven truck. That's where we've located facilities. That's how we've built roads and rest areas and all of the other things that go into it. I agree with you that this is uh, not going to have the the speed that some have suggested. Uh, it's certainly not going to put millions of, of drivers out of work. And it's going to intersect, as all big transformational changes in, in transform, uh, transportation do, with a number of other factors. And, and right now, from e-commerce, we're seeing billions of hours that we all spend, you know, transporting ourselves to stores and and you know selecting from a small number of goods. Um, we're seeing those billions of hours being transformed into jobs. And so I'm not really concerned about the number of jobs that we have in the near and medium term moving freight. I think we're going to have far far more of them. And the question is really, you know, what are those jobs going to, to look like? In my uh, research, I estimate that you know we're looking at 300 to 400 thousand jobs right now that uh, make a lot of sense to automate with the kinds of technologies that we're we're talking about. It's going to take years potentially for that that number of trucks to um, to be on the road and actually affect those jobs. I put those drivers into three basic uh, buckets, one of which are the high turnover jobs that we've just been talking about that are tough to keep people in because of the conditions that are there. Um, I don't think of those so much as drivers, as roles, because we do see such high turnover. A lot of times folks are only in those jobs for three months or six months. Um, Another, the other bucket is drivers who are in those jobs but have made them work. And a lot of times they make those work because they live in an area where the next best job isn't nearly as good. And so these are, these are some drivers that we need to think very hard about. You know, if, if long haul jobs are affected, what does it mean for drivers who live in a rural area where the next best job may pay half of what, what driving does? Um, and then the third category are some pretty good jobs that are out there that might be at the top of the list for automation and be seriously affected. And these would be like our parcel uh, line haul drivers, FedEx, UPS, um, some of the LTL companies where they're perfect for automation. Um, they make the most economic sense because the, the jobs pay really well, have benefits, very high costs. And so there we're looking at a, you know, a smaller group of drivers for sure, but some who could be directly affected by, um, by job loss. Um, but what I would say overall is if we look at all these transformations of, of trans, uh, transformations of transportation because of technology, it's never a single technology. It's always a constellation of things, whether it's, you know, shipping, canals, railroad, it's always, you know, uh, and interstate trucking, for instance, you know, it wasn't the, it's the shift from wagons to, to trucks. It was, you know, inflatable tires and, and roads that made inner city trucking. And it didn't make it, you know, exactly what it would be without federal regulation, unionization. And so we have to look at the total package of policy, infrastructure, and technology, as well as demand from companies to try to understand what this transformation might look like. Uh, for those uh, in the audience who might not know exactly what a remote operator might do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe just give us an overview. And then from there, uh, how do you see the, the future of drivers' jobs evolving in the years ahead? Um, 
basically I get up in the morning and I get to go to work in an office. And um, I haven't got to do that in a long time. Um, day to day, I sit and I monitor the um, autonomous vehicle. And um, then I go home at the end of the day. And that's very exciting for me and for my family also, because I haven't had been able to do that for years. But the, 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 what I see with the uh, future of uh, trucking is it's going to be more like a pilot. Um, it's going to be where you're going to be um, monitoring, safely monitoring the vehicle as it follows its path. Um, but we're not spending 14 weeks on the road driving that vehicle. Um, we're uh, still, uh, you know, transporting the same freight that we were transporting before, but we're doing it in a in a healthier environment. Um, I don't think that um, the, we're gonna have that big a job loss in truck drivers. We're just gonna retrain them to do something different in the trucking industry and monitor a vehicle. We're gonna need monitors to monitor the vehicle because Enrides um, has said from the start, we're never taking the human out of the loop. And um, that's, Oh, that's our safety goal. So um, Enride is very focused on safety. And um, I think that's wonderful in the trucking industry because I've been out there on the road and I see what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, um, whether it be um, personal vehicles or trucks. And it, it's very dangerous out there. And I think this is a safe solution. Yeah. Uh, Steve, your thoughts on what it's going to take for uh, fleet operators to attract that next generation and, and craft jobs that meet their requirements and, and, and fit their, uh, you know, career aspirations? Well, we have seen that get tougher because of some broader issues that the industry really can't directly address easily. And, and some of that's just broad cultural stuff. When, when I'm out interviewing truck drivers, when I meet those 30 year drivers, 40 year drivers, and I say, how'd you get into it? They say, you know, I grew up in the seventies. I watched, I don't know if this reference might go by people, but you know, BJ and the bear and Smokey and the bandit and, you know, trucks were cool. Trucking was cool. Uh, and cars and trucks were the technology. That's what drivers tell me. They were the technology that we were obsessed with as kids. We couldn't wait for that next model of, you know, Camaro or Corvette to come out. We were, well, see, I'm a Chevy guy. Uh, so, you know, th that was exciting to uh, to young people. Today, you know, the new technologies, the the phone and the the digital stuff and the AI. And so, as that you know is brought into trucking, as trucking gets kind of a, a remake around these things, I think that that could help. But the lifestyle issues are are critical. You know, young people they don't want to be out on the road all the time. You know, it's one. Th it's hard when you have a a family that is is back at home and you're out on the road. It's near impossible to start a family, right? And so we have historically seen people entering trucking later. That's part of the reason we have such an aged demographic is it's the most likely time to enter trucking is actually in your mid thirties. Uh, it's usually a second or third career for folks. And so by, you know, attracting these young people in with, with technology, we need to think about that, that pattern that's been there. And what that pattern has been is we've kind of thrown people into the toughest jobs as the portal. That's where we train and, and give them the first employment is in these high turnover, long haul companies. And so there's some real opportunities if we can you know, bring in new technology, bring in clean technology that's also local. And we begin to train people and give them jobs where they're home every night. I think that's, those are all critical pieces to attracting young people into the industry. And, you know, Tiffany, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. You think about, uh, you know, younger people entering this industry, this next generation of, of truck drivers that, you know, are, will need to, to fill the ranks of all the retirees that are going to be coming up. You know, again, it's an aging workforce. Uh, we're going to need, you know, in the near to medium term, more drivers, not fewer. Uh, what is gonna, what's it going to take for uh, trucking companies and fleet operators to uh, – bring in that next generation and, and make these jobs really make sense for them. Well, in a, in a way, what Steve was saying, you know, we, uh, different things in the trucking industry are going to appeal to the Gen X people uh, or the millennials. Uh, they're, uh, they are a generation of healthy people and um, you can't be healthy on the road. So this will be very appealing to them because they are home every day. It's, and it's also the opportunity to actually take some of the skills they learned as children playing video games. 
and put them into play in the workplace. And it's going to be much more exciting for them instead of that old stigma of a truck driver. Oh, I don't want to be a truck driver. They're gross. And um, it, it's not going to be that industry anymore. I want to make sure that we touch on the, the regulatory landscape uh, for these technologies. Uh, so uh, legislators in California you know, recently advanced a bill that would require a human operator uh, in a self-driving truck. You know, of course, it's, uh, you know, that creates a situation where it's you know, really you know, advanced driver assist if you, if you need a driver, um, if you need an operator in the vehicle. Uh, but of course, other states like Texas, Arizona have been very welcoming, very open and uh, encouraging development and deployment uh, of AV technology in their states. But uh, clearly, there's some hurdles for AV developers to overcome to um, gain the trust of the public and also lawmakers. You know, in California being a case in point where uh, you know it's not a done deal. Of course, it has to go through the state senate and you know potentially be signed by the governor. But you know, legislation that's making its way through that would require a human operator. Uh, you know, Steve, I want to bring you in on that. Uh, first off, you know, your reaction to. Uh, the regulatory environment, including you know the California bill, and uh, your thoughts on what it will take for uh, industry you know to gain the trust of you know the motoring public and of course public officials. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I'm not surprised that we're seeing pushback against, against um, self-driving for for a couple of reasons, and I, I know um, many of us, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about this, but there's, um, there's not a lot of exposure for drivers to, uh, really in-depth kind of conversations about what this might mean. And, and for good reasons, some of, some of it's uncertain, right. And we don't, we don't know exactly what, um, what these big transformations are going to look like again, because oftentimes they're contingent on what the policy is that's going to, that's going to shape these markets. But there are a couple things that I think we really need to take seriously from drivers perspectives and i spend you know most of my time talking to hundreds of drivers a year about sort of the changes in the in the industry the first one is that there's been a lot of technological change in trucking. We, we, you know, we we talk about it as if it's kind of, you know, backward and you know, um, slow to to change. But truck drivers, as a as professionals, have experienced a tremendous amount of technological change over the last few decades. We have satellite linked and cellular linked com uh, computers on trucks now that monitor everything they do. We have electronic logging devices that record their hours. Um, these kinds of technologies, and that, that's before we get into you know lane maintenance maintenance, cameras, et cetera. Um, these have all deprofessionalized the job in, in truckers' views. They've, they've made their jobs harder, more stressful. They've, they've hurt them in their paychecks. Um, and so technology is not new to truck drivers, and what they've seen so far has generally not been good for them. Now, there's some benefits to it, directions and better communications techniques. But on the whole, drivers will say that technology has not been, been good for them. So that gets to the second point. The reason that drivers think that technology has not been good for them is because they've had no say in how it's implemented. And there are many contentious issues that drivers, whether it's hours of service, um, training, other kinds of, of regulations that affect their work, drivers really don't feel like they're heard. Um, I was just out in California over the last year interviewing drivers, and, and, and they really have the sense that their opinions are not considered, um, their, their viewpoints are not considered in, in making policy and in the adoption of technology. And so we've had you know, some bad technology from the driver's perspective, a lack of feeling of voice. And honestly, if, if we all think about what the way that the industry, the tech development has, has been presented to truck drivers, from their perspective, it's been a race to get the first video of a truck without a driver in it out there, right? Um, this is, the, I mean, and you've got to think about what's, you know, what's getting to people, you know, uh, everyday people in their lives. They're not spending, you know, days looking for the latest research or having conversations with tech developers. They're like everybody else. They're going about their daily lives and they're getting, you know, mediated pictures of what this is going to look like. And the image is a truck without a driver. <laughs> so when, you, and then you say, oh, no, no, but don't worry about your job, <laughs> right? Or, or don't worry about, you know, your, your work as a truck driver, um, just because we're going to have trucks without drivers, you know, doesn't mean you're going to be affected. That's a, I mean, that's just silly that we think that truck drivers would look at a, a truck without a driver and, and not feel threatened. I mean, that is an absolutely normal 
<laughs> rational response to a technology that is, you know, going to automate big part of your job, if not all of it in the case of some, some jobs. And so we have a tremendous amount of work to do to, to get drivers, you know, to, to understand and feel invested and in, like there's a positive outcome. And some of that's going to be, you know, taking seriously those issues of voice and, and power that truck drivers don't have and not just faking it, but but really having them have a say in how this technology works. Yeah, and you certainly um, you know, my interactions as well with drivers, you you do come across the you know some angst, uh, a lot of dismissiveness. You know, oh, a, a computer could never do my job, that kind of uh, reaction. But you know, Tiffany, I'll uh, bring you in. You know, not necessarily to dive into the details of you know California's bill, but uh, what do you think are you know the keys to gaining trust for you know a company like Enride to you know, focus on safety and to roll out this technology in a responsible way. How do you present that message and make sure that you can build that trust that, you know, the industry will need? Well, I think Enright's journey is they've done, they've built a product-driven product, product -driven, um, vehicle. And um, we're looking at it from a different way than, than most people that are doing autonomous in trucking. We're not doing autonomous and using a diesel vehicle. We're doing autonomous and we're using an electric vehicle. So our key, one of our key um, th um, things that in ride, and the, one of the reasons why I came aboard is sustainability. And we need to focus on that and we need to work on that with um, moving forward in um, the trucking industry because diesel trucks are not going to be the future. And um, autonomous, I think, is going to be the future of trucking. But we are still going to need every truck driver that's out there today. Uh, I see a lot of truckers that go into the, uh, the business in their 60s and 70s because they've lost their retirement or they've, uh, you know, they've had to help a family member out with something. And they're, um, you know, they, they think they're going to live the rest of their life like we all do with what we've built our whole lives, and they're, this, the trucking industry is somewhere for them. So this would be, an, uh, Enride would be a perfect solution for them. They're, they're not going to be out on the road. They're going to be in an office working comfortably, and um, I think Enride has the, is going in the right direction, and I think they're in the right direction in persuading California to come on board. Yeah. And uh, I think I have time for one more question, unless it was one minute. Uh, I'm going to go with one question, though, so I'm going to squeeze one more in. Uh, but uh, Enride, I think, is unique in that mm -hmm. it's uh, pursuing both autonomy and electrification in tandem. Uh, most of the other developers in this space are focusing primarily on diesel based on the application that they're pursuing, you know, longer haul, uh, hub to hub routes. Uh, you know, Enride's approach is, is unique. Uh, but, but Tiffany, uh, your thoughts on you know, how electrification can fit together with autonomy and also you know, your perspective as a driver on battery electric trucks? Um, well, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I, think, I think autonomy and electrification goes hand in hand. I think there's no question about it. Um, so, I, I, I mean, when you're, in a, when you're driving on the road and you're in a diesel engine truck, the fumes are coming in the truck at all times. No one wants to do that. No one wants to live like that. Um, so I think uh, they do go hand in hand, autonomy and electrification. That's the only route to go. Um, and what else did yeah. you ask me? <laughs> oh yeah, just uh, your, your general perspective about uh, electric trucks in general. Sounds like you've you've pretty thoroughly answered that though. So I'll turn it over to Steve for you know some final thoughts on the intersection of uh, electrification and autonomy. Do you see the separate trends because they've been largely separate, right. uh, or do you see them converging? Well, I think it, it, they could be opposed to one another, right? I mean, the economics of, of autonomy favor long distances. The economics of electrification right now favors short local hauls. And so I think we've really got to think through. Now, I don't think that that necessarily has to um, you know, stop us from electrifying. I think it's absolutely critical that we do. Trucks are the the biggest bang for our buck we can get in terms of vehicles um, per per vehicle, right? In our investment in in decarbonization, and so we have to take an operational perspective. We have to understand um, the the needs of freight to move, and we need to bring together policymakers and private uh, enterprise to really restructure the system comprehensively. Um, 
I have I have an idea about how we could segment the duty cycle with these things I call urban truck ports, where you would you know electrify trucks and have local um, electric trucks. But those that's the kind of thinking I think that we need to do is what are the broad landscape kind of issues that that are going to be addressed. We can't simply try to electrify the system the way that it works now because it's just not going to be cost effective with our with the tremendous infrastructure needs yeah. um, in particular that we talked about in the last panel like we're going to have to do things differently operationally yeah for sure and i see that we're uh, i think a little bit over time so i'm going to wrap it up here uh first off uh, you know thank you all for attending and of course thank you to steve thank you to tiffany for you know, you. joining us on stage here and sharing your insights you know very great uh, you know outstanding conversation and uh, you know, find Steve and Tiffany um, the rest of the show if you have any questions for them. And uh, uh, let's go uh, have some tacos before they're all gone. <laughs>